And Lord willing, will, Lord willing, you still got all them maps I gave you, little little charts of the different things. You got the one main map that uh, shows you the completed tabernacle with the outer court and everything in it. And uh, last week we, I believe, we're moving on to the. Uh, according to this, we're moving on to the Holy of Holies eventually here. And uh, when we're done with this little booklet by Doc uh, with the basics, then uh, I want to get into the uh, tabernacle as a type of Jesus Christ and uh, the different types that are in the tabernacle. I was looking up this this week and got several pages of different things, the Ark of the Covenant, Mercy Seat, Glory, and the tabernacle. And uh, so these are things that are neat to get into because it's sort of exciting to see that when God did that, the, at no time, let me mention this so you don't get a little confused, at no time did any of them in the Old Testament know that it was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not know that. They did what God told them to do, to cover their sins. They never totally, totally took away their sins because they had to keep bringing sacrifices. Totally different than us. They had a real high priest. They had to be Levites, if you remember, uh, Aaron's seed and all that. And uh, all these have types to them. And uh, we'll explain what a type is later. And you should already know that. Uh, an example would be uh, the lamb of the sacrifice, just a simple example. God shows types in the Bible because when the New Testament starts, you have John the Baptist. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So when he said that about Jesus Christ, that we're talking about, he came unto his own, his own received him not. Who? Jesus. So he came unto the Jewish nation. He is in the Jewish nation. They are presently doing what? Sacrificing like they did before, right? <clears throat> they had a temple there, not like the tabernacle we're, we're discussing now, but the temple was still likened onto the tabernacle, meaning it had a, it had a Gentile court. Um, matter of fact, I think when they built the one, That'd be the, the, the second one. Solomon was the first one. Uh, I think they even had a, uh, they had a Gentile, and they may even had a female section. Uh, I don't know positively for that, but I think so. They kept the, they kept the genders uh, separated. But uh, anyway, what I was saying was in typology, as soon as the New Testament was written and we, we, we got it, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is referred to as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. So every Jew knew that they had to sacrifice once a year that atonement lamb. And here John is claiming that this person is a lamb. So now we have a type in the Bible, right? The lamb is a type, right? Of who? Jesus Christ. If you didn't have the New Testament though, and Christ didn't come down and get baptized by John yet, you didn't know what in the world that was or what that even meant. So we're, we're privileged as Christians to have the completed word of God, and we can actually read it, get all sorts of types out of this, because we can compare the Old Testament with the New. Uh, doctrine sometimes in the Old Testament is hidden, and it's revealed later on in the New Testament. A lot of truths are revealed in the New Testament couldn't have been known in the Old Testament. So therefore, when they say the Old Testament was looking forward to the uh, cross, they didn't even know they were looking forward to the cross. Now, when they went in the holding position, which is the center of the earth, Abraham's bosom, they were waiting for the Messiah to come because everybody was looking for the Messiah to come. Well, he came. And they'll know that at his death. He had the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. At his death, he went down and he preached to the captives over in Abraham's bosom. He preached, I don't know what he said, over on the hell side. Uh, maybe just two bad guys you didn't believe or something. <laughs> but then he came to Abraham's side and says, I'm here. I'm the Messiah. And then he took captivity captive. They were already capti captivated in Abraham's bosom. And he took them and they came up 
some of the graves were open, people was walking around, and this happened at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And also the tent of the temple was rent in twain. And we'll get into the curtain, we'll get into which, which we call the veil. And uh, tabernacle is also a word uh, that is used for our physical condition, our body. Our body is the tabernacle of who? Of Jesus Christ, if you're saved. Uh, Paul says putting off this tabernacle, meaning his body. And you can already see a type there. It'd be like the tabernacle in the wilderness is your body, right? And what nourishes your body? Bread. And how do you understand the word of God as being bread? By the light he gives you. Now we covered the candelabra, which is the lights. We, we covered the 12 loaves of bread, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and also the 66 books of the Bible. And we know that by type, how? Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Bread is a reference to the word of God. So these kinds of things, if you're a new Christian, or if you're even old but never studied them, uh, they ought to be encouraging to you that God is uh, not only on time, I mean, he's perfect, he's infinite, and he lets us finite people get involved in some of this. And uh, some of the truths that I found out, I used to get goose pimples every time a new truth come out. I'd just sit there and say, my goodness, my mind was just exploding with all this new stuff. And now I'm finding myself almost 69 years old, and it, it's like old. You know, it's like not, ref it's not as refreshing as it was when I first got the truth. Just like with the rapture, when I first found that out, oh my goodness, man. It scared me to death. I, th I thought I was going up in the rapture that day. I mean, it was that, that kind of an impact. So we encourage ourselves in the Word of God. And uh, I left off with the candelabra, I believe. So, um, so when we've uh, passed the table of showbread and the candlestick and the golden altar, we come into the next compartment, which is the Holy Holies. And you have chart, I believe, chart 7, uh, if you don't, we're going to have to make more copies for you. Keep it in your Bible. I, th I believe I gave all the charts out. If I didn't, then we'll have to do that. But chart 7 has the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat. Chapter or, or chart 6 is the censer. And we see that the altar there, the golden altar of incense. Uh, and uh, we have to remember that. And we'll, I think we've got that... Uh, uh, now, last week, I think we covered the time in Samuel about him forgetting uh, to light that candle. That, that the light went out in the holy in the holy place, and uh, God definitely started stirring and, and got some people in trouble for that. Um, we also know that uh, in 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 chart six, the golden altar of incense, it could only be kindled with the fire from the brazen altar of sacrifice. Any other kindling would be strange fire. What do you mean? Uh, the censer that had incense, they would take the, the fire off the altar there, put it in there, then put the incense, sprinkled incense on there, and then you get that odor. But it was specific. It had to be specifically the coals that are in that altar. You couldn't light it any other way. Why? Because God said so. And that's the difference between... <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the difference between our salvation, no matter what anybody says. And I've mailed a lot of you guys, emailed you guys uh, some things about that. Uh, dismantled uh, by Brother Walker, I think. You should have it in your email. And um, 24 pages on, he covers a lot of that stuff today where people are getting down on different salvations, saying that's not right, and we're heretics, and all this kind of stuff. So um, he answers that. All right. Let me get here. Mm-hmm. All right. So you find uh, this in the tabernacle, uh, the Holy of Holies, that is, the Ark of the Covenant. It uh, definitely represents the presence of God. Uh, the Lord said he would be in this area and would be over the mercy seat. Uh, what's the mercy seat? That's where the presence of God was in the ark. The ark sat 
in the Holy of Holies, and it too had rings on it, uh, and uh, <laughs> the mercy seat was at the same level. Now, this is a strange thing. We're talking about level. We're talking about height, just so you understand about this level. Um, the mercy seat was at the same level as the great in the brazen altar in the courtyard. You remember the brazen altar in the courtyard? Okay, one door going in. Remember the eastern door, which in the temple, and then in Jerusalem is going to be the eastern gate. Uh, Herod's temple was facing that way. If you wanted, you had to go into eastern. The the eastern opening was the only opening into the uh, tabernacle here, and um, so you'd bring your sacrifice to the opening. You'd meet the priest that was there. They would go through the ritual of him putting his hand on it. You putting your hand on the uh, that we, they call it escape. The, what is it? The scapegoat, you know, more or less. And um, so that represented your sins. And then he would take it in, and they had a process of cutting it up, uh, and they had a, they had a way of uh, putting it on the grate, which is that brazen altar, and uh, they would do that burnt offering right there, that once a year thing. And so if you came in and you saw the grate, right, you'd see the lamb stuff on top of that grate. Well, what Doc's saying here and what Exodus says, the measurements, this is how you get the stuff. Somebody says, why do they always put cubics in, in that? What, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal is this. According to the way the tabernacle was laid out on the land, and that being the foundation for everything, the measurement of the brazen altar came to a certain height. Not like the wash basin, different height. So what you would do when you looked in the gate, through the gate, you see the lamb, and you know what else is the same level? The mercy seat. Now nobody could see the mercy seat because nobody better go in the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest, right? once a year, remember that? Putting the blood on everything in there. It was just amazing though if you think about it, you got the brazen altar representative of also hell. And the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Going there, dumping off your sins. And it's in line with the mercy seat. I just think that's interesting. Go to uh, Exodus uh, 37. In the Old Testament there, Exodus 37. Now, the only way I know about this, I read, read other people, Doc, Larkins, other people, and, uh, and uh, I believe um, oh, there's another guy. Whew, good old guy that goes through all the different things. He's passed now. Anyway, I, I didn't know nothing about these measurements. Who, you know, I'm read my. It was hard enough trying to read my Bible and understanding that. And you all know if you got into Chronicles, you know what I'm talking about. You know, and after a while, Leviticus, Levites, okay, fine, they're priests and they got to do all this stuff. Fine. Why do I got to think about all this cotton and not mixing it with wool and what in the world is with all this stuff? Then you read these guys like Ebersheen or something with the tabernacle. He's got a book on there in the times and, uh, of Jesus Christ, big old fat book. He goes through the customs. He goes through what the Jews do. He's a Jew. And you start reading this stuff, and you start finding out the linen, the way it is, and the cotton, very important. Do you know why? It wicks perspiration. God didn't even want to smell the priest's stinky flesh. You get into that stuff, you're saying, <coughs> what in the world? And us today, I was taught at Midwestern years ago by the old preachers, stay away from polyester suits. Stay away from the funny materials in white shirts. You get cotton. I didn't listen. Why? Because, man, we had kids. I needed money. You could buy one of them suits for 100 bucks back when I could fit in all that stuff. You get two, three suits for 100 bucks, man, at the warehouse. 
you know, and you could ball them up and throw them in the back seat, and they don't wrinkle or nothing. It was sort of good. But, man, you got behind the pulpit, you start teaching or preaching a little while, and next thing you know, you're sweating profusely, man. It doesn't breathe. What does that prove? I think some old saint was probably reading that and saying, hmm, let me see here. Or they were older saints. <laughs> there was no polyester back in those days. And when the new stuff come on, they tried it and it didn't work. Anyway, it was passed on, and it's, it's, a good thing, it's a good thought for us. If you're in all that health food and everything, they're going to tell you what to wear, too. Man, get that cotton. You can get wool. Wool has different blends. I have, I have wool suit for summer. They got wool suit for, you know, different weights all up to winter. I got a three-piece. If I can fit it again this year, I'll wear it again. I mean, it is warm. It's thick. And uh, so there's something with the natural materials. And God, he knew about it, tells the priest that. Why are you saying all this? Because when you're reading your Bible, these, I don't know about you, but cubics and everything, uh, the scopher or something, I like, or even docks, I, I look, go to seven, because I don't know what they're talking about. It's compared to th uh, 28 inches. Okay, I can handle that. I, you know, we put a guy on the moon without metrics, right? But anyway, cubics I found out a standard measurement also. But in my mind, it's, it could be Greek, you know. I don't even know what they're talking about. So here, at any rate, God is giving all these measurements. In 37 verse 1 it says, I believe, yep, and uh, Bezalel made the ark of shit and wood, Two cubics and a half was the length of it, and a cubic and a half the breadth of it, and a cubic and half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold, within without, and made a crown of gold to it round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set by the four corners of it, even two rings upon the one side of it and two rings upon the other side of it. And he made staves, uh, uh, and I always say, I wouldn't want to say this word 10 times in a row, uh, chitham, I'll just go like that, wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he put the staves into the rings of the sides of the ark to bear the ark. Why is it important for those verses right there? Because if you ever read Uzzah, when you're going through with David, when the, when, the, when the ark is finally returning, if you remember the story, if you don't, you can start reading your Bible. This is, this is Bible. The ark was taken from Israel. They lost the presence of God. If you remember the, the Philistines or something, they put it in a place with their gods. And there was a fish god called Dagon. Uh, why? I don't know. They come up with a fish god. They worshipped everything. They had all sorts of different fit, uh, gods. The interesting part about Dagon, the fish god, is the Catholic Church picked up on a lot of that, and that's where they get them hats they got on. If, you look, if, you, if a bishop and a pope turn sideways with that uh, a mitre on, it looks like a fish's head. Just interesting, you know. And there's history with the thing around her neck, you know, a little collar there. And then they dress like Old Testament priests, that's where they get the dresses. You know, they take a little bit from here, a little bit from there. That's what the devil does. And all of a sudden, boom, they show you a verse. And you try to show other verses around her to disprove them. They say, oh, no, 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 you're not learned. You got to go to seminary to learn this stuff, man. You got no authority to, to translate or interpret scripture. That's them, see. And every Catholic knows that. If uh, they're a real Catholic... <laughs> staunch Catholic, the only one that reads now and they allow him is a lay or a deacon in the church and they get to read a little bit of the scripture before the pastor of the church versus the priest does his homily. I watch this stuff. I'm saying hmm. what does that mean? That means when you come knock on your door and say well you need a Bible authority, our church reads the Bible. We got the Bible. We study it. No, you study catechism but yeah, amen. They, so now they read the scripture a little bit. You know, but they still tell their people what? You're not learned. You have to go to seminary to learn this. Or they have little classes now where the Knights of Columbus come in and they teach them just what they need to try to support them in that religious activity that they have. Why is uh, it still a failure? Because they have to work. They still have to work and maintain if they're even going to get any graces to get out of purgatory and go to heaven. It's wrong. 
So when I'm studying my Bible here now, after all these years, and, and answering a lot of questions that I had when I was younger, I'm finding out, my goodness, it's right in my Bible. Stuff's right in my Bible here. So I remember the first time I read that story. I don't know if you did or if you heard a preacher teach it, but um, I heard it several years ago about different versions coming into church, you know, and, and what he was saying was the ark don't need a new, new uh, it doesn't need a new, uh, new way to be handled. You know, everybody's trying to make a new way, easier way to do it. Well, I'm reading this story, man, and, it's, and here's this guy. He's minding his own business. He knows that he's so excited about the ark coming back. It represents the presence of God, and what? They did it on a cart. That's a no-no. Why? I'm, I just read these verses to you. You don't put it on no cart. Well, somebody told him to put him on a cart. Oh, what's up with David? He wanted it back quick, man. He figured it ain't no big deal. And so here's, I believe his name's Uzzah or something, and they're walking, and the thing hits a bump, and it's ready to fall, right? What did he do? Now, you can't tell me he had bad intentions. He had great intentions. He didn't want nothing to happen, and that's the presence of God. And what did God do? Killed him. You read the story. David's all bummed out a little bit. What in the world? God gives us the ark. I'm bringing it back, man, as quick as I... You're not bringing it back the right way. God doesn't compromise. That's, we compromise and shouldn't. He don't compromise. He didn't care about their emotional attachment. He didn't care about them trying to do the best way that they thought they could. He cared about what he commanded them to do, and that was carry that ark with staffs. And that's why he made it that way. Get preaching on this stuff. Go on, see. Okay, go to go to Exodus 27. Let's see. We were just uh, talking about them cubics and the height. Let's see, 27. Come on, Bob. Twenty-seven and verse, let's see, one and verse five. And thou shalt make an altar of chitham wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Come down to verse 5. And thou shalt put it under the, uh, the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even, even to the midst of the altar. You see that? Giving you directions on how tall it's going to be, where it's going to be located, that is the brazen altar. So if you go to the cubics right there, uh, the height thereof, and uh, you look at the height thereof of the mercy seat, that is the connection that I'm talking about. You wouldn't know that unless you went to the scriptures and you saw the measurements. I read through the Bible. I wouldn't have stopped and thought about none of that stuff. I just, what are you doing, preacher? I'm just going to hurry up and get through so I can get rid of Exodus. I'm getting out of there. Like, Exodus is exit of Egypt. I want to, when I get in Exodus sometimes, I just want to move on. Why? Because i got to finish my Bible. But when you stop and you start studying certain things topically in your Bible, that's when the other stuff is necessary. So I just want you to know that God didn't just put fluff in here. Every word is pure with God. Every word, man, you can approach that lots of different ways. Same truth, main truth, but you can, I mean, illustrations and different things with words. Mm, just something else. So if you stood in the courtyard looking toward the tabernacle and drew a horizontal line with a surveyor's instrument looking across that grate, that's the top of that, I barbecue thing, right? <laughs> you, couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't see the presence of God without looking right through the lamb that was burning. Now, you take out your Bible, and you look at the measurements, as we did. One and a half cubics, one and a half cubics. Christ said, this is what's... Mm, Christ said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what our Lord said. Where's the Father located in the Old Testament? On the mercy seat. What do you got to look at? 
before you see it? That lamb. Now, once again, this is the problem. I went through a fundamental school. And, and to answer all dispensations, Rodrigo, it's easier, right? They were all looking toward the cross. And now we all look back at That sounds great. Skip everything. Yeah, and Paul had a Cadillac, right? Well, if you haven't got an ad-lib Bible, if you ever get a chance to, I shouldn't even push that. <sighs> ad-lib Bible by Dr. Ruckman. He talks about Paul's uh, Camelac, you know, and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. I mean, you get down there after a while, I'm telling you, you ask my wife, we had to shut it off. I mean, I was reading my Bible, <laughs> talking like Doc, oh man, you know. I mean, and it's, it's like illustrated Bible. And uh, I get your curiosity up. If you get it, you listen to it, you hooked. You hooked. I'm just saying, you got to put it down to read your Bible, or you're going to be thinking like he's illustrating. And it's, it's bizarre. So anyway, Ad Lib Bible is the name of the study. And uh, so this is why we said what we said because of the measurements. And the measurements normally, when you read your Bible, you don't consider too much, and you move on. It's just like the ark. Now, I disagree with Ham on a lot of things, dispensationally and stuff, but I'll tell you, I know he's saved, uh, and I know that he took the measurements from the Bible, and he put that ark up. And I don't know about you, but that blessed my heart just going by it and seeing. Never been in it yet. We went to the museum. But uh, my goodness, it's huge. You know what it answers? Them skeptics that say you couldn't have put the species, all the species in it. Bet me. How many boxcars could they fit in that? And when you, so we see it. So why is it such an impact? With your eyes visually, you can see it now. But somebody had to go through all the measurements, right? And do it. And guess what? God knew ahead of time that this stuff was going to happen, so he put the measurements in there for it to happen. Curiosity of man, the curiosity's in him, his imagination, his intellect, his reasoning power, all part of the creation process that God put in him. All innate things. And um, that's why it's important to teach your own kids or know what's being taught to them, because somebody's putting something in them. Now, another strange thing about the construction of this ark and this tabernacle, when God gave the instructions for making the tabernacle, uh, do you know which item inside was first? Hmm. Wait a minute. In other words, God's planning the tabernacle, right? God's planning. No. It's already taken care of, right? We know that. Why? Because there's something up in heaven, correct? It's made after something up in heaven. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So here he is. He's going to pen out stuff that these Jews are going to have to do. Okay, well, you got to have this. you got to have, you know, uh, you know the perimeter's got to be uh, so many feet, so many squares, like a rectangle. Uh, you're going to have an outer court. You're going to have a place for the priest, you know, to be, their clothes and everything hung up and everything. He goes through all this stuff, right? No, the first thing he does is he has them do something. Do you know what it is? First thing that he does, they have to make the Ark of the Covenant. The first thing to the tabernacle. The Ark's got to be made first. So the first item that he told him to make was the ark. Do you know what that shows you? It shows that if you ever approach God, he will have to initiate it. What do you mean? What do you mean what I mean? It means God moves first. Well, that messes up a lot of Catholics, a lot of work people, a lot of everything, don't it? Yeah, God moves first. You got saved, you know why? You weren't looking for God, he was looking for you. 
Amazing, the song Amazing Grace handles a whole th- a lot of theological junk. If people just believe what it says, I mean, I, was, I mean, Newton had that down, man, John. And, uh, I, yeah. and, uh, and I often thought about that. We, me and Richard went and visited John. By the way, we, everybody can visit John now. And he's got a clear head. You can go see him. Everybody can go see him. And uh, part of our family. Amen. And, uh, but, uh, he kept bringing up stuff that God was in his life. And I, I agreed. I says, yeah, God was in your life. And he's sitting there and talking to me and Richard. He's saying, it's just like I'm just, I just think about everything. I, I can see God my whole life. I says, yes, you can. But you didn't see it when you were going through it. Do you know why, John? Why? You weren't saved yet. He's, it's like he's 91, but he's like just experiencing mature, a little maturity in the Christian faith. And I have to keep saying it. it's it's because he'll bring up Catholic stuff still. He'll bring up us. I, mm. I says the reason you can see back now is because Christ put eternity in you. You and him is a family now. Now you can look back and say, my goodness. How do you know that? Because I know what the devil does. Now he takes you back. <laughs> He's all the junk and stir you up. Only saved people can experience this stuff. So Doc here made a good point. He says the first thing they met, um, had to make was the ark, and that represented what? The presence of God. Then the other stuff goes together. He initiates everything. It's hard for people to comprehend that. No, I remember. I remember I was sitting there, and I heard the message, and, and you heard the message. How would you even get in the environment where you could hear the message? Who gave you the message? What did you hear? Why didn't you ever hear it before? Because God wanted you to hear it. Therefore, I'm a Calvinist. Since he initiated everything, bless God, he, I must be saved too. Just get born in it. No, 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 no. You're going to find out through this tabernacle, the whole purpose is to please God. But guess what? If you didn't do what he told you to do, I hate to say it, but you dropped dead. You and I have done enough stuff since we were saved to drop dead probably a thousand times. For people to go to the Old Testament and try to make it like us, is they're out of their mind. Man, we got sealed. Now, God makes no mistakes, but if, if, if I was like, if, if I was in charge, I would be watching how they all filled in the Old Testament, right? I'm saying, man, we got to do something about this. We ain't had nobody left. What can I do? I'm going to go in them and not leave this town. I'm going to seal, seal them. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so when he created the new person on the inside, guess what? You ain't leaving until he comes back or you die, right? So you're trapped in the body, but that body is dead to Christ. Your new man is a new inheritance. You're in the family now. But all that started because of God. God showed you. God was merciful to you. God was long-suffering until you got to that certain place. God. Does he have to do that with everybody? To be just? No, he's just. He's just all the time. He's jealous. He hates stuff. Hmm. No, I guess he can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Esau have I, what? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Somebody says, well, what kind of God is that? He's God. I just leave that alone. He's God. <laughs> what did Esau do that would offend God so much? Sold the birthright. Old Testament, firstborn. Whew. God already told him. Told Isaac, told them all that Jacob would be the one anyway. Jacob should just wait it, but Mama wanted a little quick thing, right? But it wasn't possible until Esau wanted to give that offer to Jacob, then Jacob deceived him. But Esau gave up that birthright, and to God, that's like a no-no. Bad enough to, for him to say what he said about him. Whew. 
All right, we're still in the Ark of the Covenant. The presence of God was made first. Uh, works out to you. <laughs> works out to you first before you can get in and uh, once again no hyper Calvinists uh, we don't believe that a man has to be regenerated before he can believe but I believe in grace I believe God has to deal with that sinner before he can believe of course I believe that God deals with sinners but if he didn't you never could get to him God Almighty has to lay his hand on you and show you your condition or you'll never see it. And that begins at the ark, the presence of God. And, uh, and that's a good thing to use with people that are lost. Is the fact to let them know. You can be a skeptic all you want or whatever, but don't you find it amazing that we're here talking about discussing God. And I know God. And you don't. God set this appointment up. And then also with people that are saved and are experiencing all sorts of uh, backslidden thoughts and all this stuff, you look at me and say, guess what? You never thought like this before you were saved. See, you've got to get them out of that frame of mind that the devil can use. You never thought like that before you were saved. And isn't it amazing now you see all the flaws? And the reason it upsets you is because you know God's holy and he doesn't like that stuff. And here you're stuck in this filthy, stinking flesh. And sometimes you mess up and you do the stuff that the flesh has you to do. And then the devil comes and says, well, you couldn't be saved if you do any of these things. See, you have an opportunity with people to get them out of doubts. Now, you can't make them do that, but you can sure tell them what I just told you. And sometimes that's enough to snap somebody out of that junk and say, you know what, you're right. I never did look at myself like this before. Well, what is that called? It's called assurance of salvation. A lot of people out there roaming around don't know this stuff. They're going crazy, I'm telling you. And God's got us as ambassadors for him, reconciling a, a world to him. Now, if, if you think about everything, when you start a building, they have what's called a plumb bob, and uh, you can get a Home Depot and all this stuff. We're going to wreck the wall, uh, anything from the foundation up. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get perpendicular, straight. And this plumb, if it's plumbed, it's in. You can actually take a laser, and you can draw a line, and that plumb will be old-fashioned plumb will be just as straight as that laser will be so when if 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 god was to build that tabernacle with other things first it'd be like taking a plumb and trying to throw it <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> oh yeah let's, let's, we'll put that over here yeah no no we'll put that over there no you, you got to have that standard it's got to start with god plumb is very important draw that plumb line so when he goes in those measurements and stuff you if you start studying this you're going to find out he gave wisdom to certain people certain craftsmen to do certain things the uh, uh, ornate stuff around some of the tables and that the metal work man that had to be beautiful and uh, had to be straight when they made that, all the corners had to be straight. They had levels. They had to square. They had to plumb. Just good stuff to think about. Surely wouldn't want to start with something other than God. And uh, what else here? You have to hang it when you think about it. The plumb, that is. You hang it down from the top. You don't take the plumb and reverse it. That plumb is from the top down. Well, that isn't how folks think you get to heaven, is it? Folks try to get to heaven by working their way up from the bottom. Now, isn't that stupid? You know what God does? He hangs the plumb line down from above. 
Do you know what the plumb line is? It is Jesus Christ. It begins at the ark with the presence of God. There was no light. Listen to me. There was no light in the Holy of Holies at all. Inside the ark were the tables of stone on which the Ten Commandments were, were uh, chiseled out there. And there were cherubim kneeling over the ark with their faces down toward the ark. It was uh, pitch black in there. And, uh, but guess what? Correction. God is light. So since there's no light in there, you know what you assume? It's dark. But the presence of God is light. There's no darkness in him. So I don't know if you looked at the sun lately, directly. I think we were driving one time looking at it. I said, man, imagine looking at the Lord. Or you get these new LED lights now. My goodness, man. Everybody, you think they got their brights on? They don't. They got these new stupid lights. And they blind you. Well, when that old uh, priest uh, stepped in there, he had the weirdest feeling, you know. <laughs> I mean, you and I are glad we're under grace, I'll just tell you that. And uh, thank God I'm not the high priest and have to start down through, through there to offer the atonement and have the blood on me while thinking, my God, am I clean? Am I clean? Did I wash enough? Do I have the right kind of underwear? Do I have all my sins confessed? Do I have them all judged? Why? Don't you know that they had to have linen clothes, clothes on that wouldn't cause sweat? I mean, you can't, can't get in with the wrong kind of clothes either. Then I would come in there and open the veil, and here is this room as bright as a 500-watt bulb but there's no candle in there. Man, I'd step in there and put the blood on the mercy seat and there would be a thousand watts of light with no candle in sight. God is in there. I'd take the blood, I'd put it on the mercy seat, get off, bow down, get out, and run for my life. <laughs> then I'd have to do it all over again next year. And the Catholics think that they're doing this every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So you get the old Hebrews 9 and 10, or chapters 9 and 10. I'll read that. You can just put Hebrews 9 and 10 down. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, Old Testament that we're reading about now, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, what's the key here? As a Christian, I don't have to keep going back. And the high priest don't have to keep going in and out. All these things that I'm telling you now is revelations from the Holy Spirit of God to your heart. When that's fixed in there, when your spirit is his spirit, the truths are evident to you, you can never get, you'll never lose them. They're in there. And by me telling you that, you already know. There's no way that the Catholic Mass or anybody working can make it to heaven. Why? He did it all. The little word finish is in the Gospels there. Christ said, it is finished. Oh, well, what is finished? Well, by his stripes, we're healed. You mean from disease? No, nobody reads the context of Isaiah. They take a verse out of context. From, our, from the penalty of sin, we're healed. He suffered all for us. Can God heal? Sure he can. But don't take a verse out of context. That whole entire chapter 53 is about our crucified Savior. I mean, this ain't heaven. He ain't worried to, to build us and we're going to live down here forever. No, we have a purpose down here. It's temporary. Eternity's later on. If he keeps you living, can he heal you? Sure he can. You pray for that. Paul prayed for that. Paul healed other people, couldn't heal himself. Duh. 
And the last thing Paul tried to do was, remember somebody was left at Troas, sick? He couldn't heal him. It was his best friend. And then the rest of the Bible doesn't have nothing about healing. Duh. Why? Because we walk by faith, not by sight. And God is not a bellhop. So how do you pray? Lord, if it's your will, please take this from me. You know, might be his will. Okay. But if it ain't, his grace is sufficient for you. And that's the hard part. That's why everybody's giving all these money to all these other people because they don't want to face that. No, you face Scripture. It's the best way to go. <sighs> what a blessing. Now, <laughs> the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. We're going to stop right here. This study's going to go a while, I'm telling you. And... Uh, So we'll close here, take a little break. If there's any coffee, do what you got to do. Stay up.